Hey everyone, thanks for coming. My name's Alex Blandy, and I'm a friend and engineer. Uh, if you like this talk, if it moves you and makes you want to replace all of your CSS with inline styles, give me five stars. So I'm from Seattle, which is awesome. It looks like this like five days a year, like this the rest of the time. And I work at a company called Formidable. We're a consultancy building JavaScript web apps and data visualization. So today, well, for the past year or so, I've been exploring styling web applications using inline styles instead of CSS. Uh, it sounds kind of sacrilegious, but it's pretty great. It solves a lot of issues that you face in writing CSS, especially on large projects. And I think it's going to have a profound impact on the future of CSS as a language. We'll come back to this a little bit later. So a large part of my role at Formidable is working on CSS architecture. I told that to someone recently, and they said, I've never heard the word CSS and architecture in the same sentence before, which is a pretty common reaction. So what does it mean to work on CSS architecture? I work on code organization, style guides, documentation, code review, linting, standards, that kind of thing. I do this in projects like Walmart.com. Walmart's an extremely large, responsive e-commerce site. There are about 80 developers writing CSS to varying degrees on the front end at any given time. A lot of these developers aren't familiar with scalable CSS best practices. A lot of them aren't particularly interested in CSS architecture, period. And I think that's OK. In a lot of ways, the role of a CSS architect is to care about these things so that not everyone has to, at least not too much. So what does architecture look like at Walmart? It includes things like a living style guide, we generate this after every successful pull request. It includes every reusable component in the application, usage examples, different modifiers, instructions for usage. This is a great resource for developers and designers alike. It includes structured naming conventions for our class names and selectors. These help us to kind of identify what different classes mean, how they work together, and avoid naming collisions in our code base. We have strict authoring guidelines in place. We're constantly updating these based on feedback. These include just basic information for how to be productive writing CSS on a project of this scale. This includes information like avoid overly specific selectors, avoid too general ones, make your CSS dry, don't use magic numbers, all that good stuff. And we practice code review extremely heavily. So Walmart is made up of numerous small teams that build out different parts of the application. When you submit a pull request with some code, someone on your immediate team is going to review it and let you know if everything's good. And someone who works on the global styles is going to take a look also. This helps the global CSS authors kind of keep track of what's going on throughout the project, identify issues before they make it into the code base, and identify room for improvement in the global style framework. I'm happy to say that with those four things, our CSS architecture was totally perfect. We never had any problems at all. CSS is a solved problem. Just kidding. Things were terrible a lot of the time, because it turns out that writing large-scale CSS is really hard. There are a lot of challenges that come with it. So what are some things we faced? One of the biggest things was dealing with specificity. So in CSS, different selectors have different specificity levels. If two selectors apply to the same element, the rules with more specificity are going to win. An ID is more specific than a class name, et cetera. So Harry Roberts of CSS Wizardry fame came up with the concept of a specificity graph. This is a way of visualizing how your specificity pans out throughout your style sheets. This is an example of one at the bottom here. So ideally, your specificity graph should be as flat as humanly possible with the more specific styles coming towards the end. And this is Walmart's here. And you can see it's not too bad. There's a really big spike at the end there, which is a little larger than I'd like it to be. But generally, it's not terrible. You can compare it to some of our competitors. And you can see it's in pretty good shape, really. The thing is that even with a pretty good specificity graph, you're going to have problems a lot of the time. And they kind of sneak up on you. So let me look at an example of how specificity can get out of control very quickly. You can imagine that we're building a new website. It has a white background and an orange header and no other content. It's very modern. Later on, we want to add some links to it. Because orange is our dominant color, our links will be orange as well. So we add a global A color orange rule to style them. This is pretty typical. You've probably written such a rule many times yourself. 
Later on, we want links in the header as well. So we add another selector. We target an element with a class name of header and target links inside of it and style them as white. Again, pretty standard. Oop, wrong direction. Later on in development, we start to add some components. We might add something like a flyout. Flyouts are used to control or contain menu items, that kind of thing. They have a white background and orange links within them. Because the links inside of our flyouts are the same color as links in the normal site, we don't add any extra CSS to style them. We just accept that we get that global rule for free, and cascading CSS is awesome. Later on, say we move one of these flyouts into the header, we see something weird has happened. Our orange link is gone. The reason for this is that we defined that header A color white rule before. So the flyout is seeing that rule and is styling links incorrectly. To work around this, we might do something like this. We can set the color of links in flyouts back to orange. This is kind of a way to safely reset this style so that we can predict that anywhere we use a flyout, we'll get the correct link color, the one we expect. Later on in development, we add even more components. Website's getting very complicated. So we add a login button, and buttons have an orange background and a white text color. Everything is great. Then we move one of these buttons into that flyout inside the header, and things have gone awry again. So our flyout A color orange rule is affecting this button in a way we didn't expect. So if you're really familiar with CSS, how specificity works, how source order works, Maybe you'll refactor that. It's probably a good idea. You can break it down a little bit. Don't use these selectors, and you can find a nicer way to deal with it. Someone who isn't overly interested in CSS is just trying to write a component and get their job done. Maybe they'll add this selector. They'll style buttons instead of flyouts and set the color back to white. This is OK. It's kind of specific to this one use case. Maybe not an awesome solution. Maybe something a little more powerful would be to use an important declaration and set our button color to white all the time. This way, we can be sure that buttons, which are a pretty granular component, will be pretty much styled the way we want. It's pretty good shape. Or maybe we'll write a really gnarly selector. We'll say that if a button appears in a flyout inside a header, this one really specific use case, we set the color back to white. And this will work for now. Then we have to hope that none of those rules we just added negatively affect any of the other buttons we have in this application because we have like 20 modifiers. We have different states. Sometimes we put them in groups together and they have different styling applied. And we have to work around any additional styles for those to make sure that important color white declaration doesn't break anything else. So outside of that, source order is a problem too, which is funny because source order is a little bit easier to understand for CSS noobs. You know, if two selectors have the same specificity, the one that comes later in the style sheet is going to win. So that's usually OK, especially in smaller style sheets. On a larger project, sometimes it's hard to keep track of where things are in that style sheet. And if you're loading, say, multiple style sheets asynchronously in a non-deterministic order, so you don't know which order they're going to come in, it can be pretty problematic. So another example, if we think back to our header flyout. Previously, we defined the header rule before the flyout rule, and we can see that everything looks great. Imagine now that we reverse those two declarations. And our link has disappeared because the header declaration comes last and wins. Again, this is something that's pretty easy to deal with, but it can be hard to track down in a large code base with a lot of things going on. And it can cause a lot of frustration. Naming collisions were kind of a constant source of trouble, too, for some reason. It turns out that you run out of good, unique class names a little bit quicker than you might think. The reason for that is that in CSS, all of our class names, all of our IDs, all of our selectors are global. We have this style sheet that lives over here, with all of our styles applied, and we have our DOM over here. If any of these things match up, they'll apply, whether we intend them to or not. We don't have any concept of real scope. So how do we work around this? There aren't any great answers, really. You can search your code base thoroughly before you add a new class name. You can use a coding convention, you know, so you have some sort of structured class names and you avoid collisions a little bit. You can code review a lot. Or you can do something like this. You could use a namespaced selector option, style buttons inside of sidebars instead of product pages. This will work, and it sort of works as scoping, but it's going to increase your specificity, which, as we discussed before, is not awesome. Dealing with dead code in CSS is kind of troublesome, too. Because all of your styles are global, 
because they can sometimes interact in ways you don't expect, removing CSS after you've written it is easier said than done. So you end up with dead code forever. Not always forever, but in a lot of cases, you'll find that it's easier to mark something as deprecated and not suitable for additional use, then remove it really slowly over time so you don't accidentally break any existing usage. This is okay, but it means that typically what happens is that people write more CSS instead of removing it when issues arise, which makes things worse. So together, all these factors means that your CSS is often hard to change. If you can't modify your code, it's very hard to maintain it. It's hard to work in a large system with a large project over multiple years if you can't change your code over time. So let's have a show of hands here. Has anyone here ever wished that they could declare style bankruptcy on a project? Just delete all of the CSS and start over? Like, you'd be like, in two weeks, we'll write everything over again. It'll be perfect. Of course it wouldn't be. It might be a little bit better, honestly. But you're going to have problems in that two-week sprint also. It's always going to be a challenge. So yeah, in my experience, these five issues make writing large-scale CSS tough and often not very fun. I think the problem is that CSS makes it really easy to do the wrong thing and considerably harder to do the right thing. So we're always looking for the good parts. We're looking to different methodologies and systems, BEM and SMAX and OSCSS. We're looking for tools like UnCSS. And these things help. But the wide proliferation is indicative of a problem. So while I was kind of stewing about these things, feeling very depressed about my CSS skills, I became interested in a JavaScript framework called React, released by Facebook. React is a framework for writing applications with a component model. And that's some nice things, nice things going for it. It's fairly performant by default. It is a one-way data flow model. It's pretty easy to understand. The thing that's probably most interesting to CSS aficionados is that everything in a React application is a component. You tie them together to build pages. So this maps extremely well to a modular design system, something you put into a style guide. Your buttons, your flyouts, your sidebars, all of these are React components that are encapsulated into your framework. So how does this work? You can imagine here we have a code sample from your style guide. You have a button class. When you use it, you always want this type button attribute. And this is pretty simple. It might get a little more complicated if you deal with modifiers, many different DOM structures. In React, you encapsulate this into a capital B button component. Any implementation details of how that component's written, any DOM structure within it, any class names, any attributes, any ARIA roles, is all encapsulated in the button, so people using it on your team don't need to be aware of those things. They get the intended behavior by default, and they can't accidentally break it somehow. Plus, if you need to change those things over time, you can change it globally in one swoop, rather than having to search through your code base and find every instance. This works for much more complex components as well. You can imagine you have a flyout that has a few different wrapping divs, maybe a decorative eye element, a title. And again, we encapsulate this in React into a flyout component. It can take an optional title attribute and some content, and that's it. Aside from being a nice interface, this way of encapsulating components into a smaller sort of portion that different people on the team didn't need to be aware of implementation details is very attractive. So this didn't really solve my CSS issues. I couldn't even use React on that project. But it got me thinking, you know, wondering what it would look like for CSS to have that kind of encapsulation, that kind of ease of control. So I started thinking about the future a little bit. So not too long after I started digging into React, I heard a very interesting story about inline styles. At NationJS 2014, Christopher Shadow a Facebook engineer on the React team, gave a talk called React, CSS in JS. I was intrigued. I was also very skeptical. If you, if you ever look at Hacker News or something, you'll probably see some write all of your CSS and JavaScript thing every couple months, and they've never been that compelling to me. But I watched this talk. In it, Christopher outlined seven problems that Facebook faced when writing large-scale CSS on Facebook. And I looked at these. And I wasn't too surprised to see that they lined up with the issues I was facing. I was kind of relieved, actually, you know, not alone. So I was a little more interested when Christopher's solution to this issue 
was to abandon CSS entirely and write all of your styles inline using React components. I was kind of like, people do anything with JavaScript nowadays. Ridiculous. But I was kind of intrigued. I thought about it in the back of my head a little bit. But I wasn't sure where to go with it. How would I use this in a project? So I pushed it to the side. I wrote more CSS, as I often do. Not long after this, my friend and coworker Colin McGill came to my desk. He had seen the talk, too, and wanted to talk about it because he knew I was obsessed with styling things. So he was really intrigued by this, and he asked me what I thought. I told him it was cool, but I didn't know how you'd write a real application that way. There are a lot of features that inline styles just don't have that you kind of need, crucial things. So Colin said, OK, what's missing, and how do we build it? That conversation kickstarted development of a library called Radium. Radium is a tool set to make inline styling easier than writing CSS. So how does it work? Before we dig into Radium specifically, we should talk about the utilities that React provides for writing inline styles. So typically, React applications are written using a JavaScript extension language called JSX. It's effectively JavaScript that you can drop into this HTML-like syntax in the middle of, so you can write your component structure in pretty much HTML right in line with the behavior for that component. And it's pretty nice writing this way once you get used to it. One of the cool features that React includes by default is styling or handling style attributes in a nice way. If you were to write inline styles traditionally, you'd have to write these strings of CSS, semicolon separated, and it's not very maintainable if you really wanted to do that. React gives you a nice abstraction and allows you to apply JavaScript objects with style rules in, in, in place of those strings. Then when React renders applications, it'll convert those into the actual inline styles that you see on the page. So it's pretty much like writing CSS, except that you're not dealing with selectors anymore. You're dealing with objects that you're applying to components. You can pass them around your application, you can merge them together, you could change them based on user input, whatever you want to do. But you're still writing a kind of CSS-like thing. You're not writing actual, literal inline styles. So for a lot of cases, this is really all you need. You can imagine you have a button. You can apply things like a background color and padding. There are other styles also, but I don't want to bog this slide down with everything you need for an actual button. And then again, that's encapsulated into the React component. So a person consuming it doesn't have to think about this style attribute and what's going on. They just have this button interface that they can use easily. So what are some benefits of this? One of the major things is you get, um, well, you get to use real JavaScript variables, just like SAS or stylus variables, except that they're working at runtime. You get all the power of JavaScript. You can compute things. You can share them around your application. You could change the entire font size of your app depending on a person's mouse cursor position if you wanted for some reason. Don't do that. Um, specificity is less of a challenge, too, with this approach, which is very nice. So I say here there's no specificity. What I really mean is there's a whole lot of specificity, like a ton. But what, so inline styles have extremely high specificity. You need an important declaration, typically, if you want to override them. The thing is that if all of the styles in your app had the same specificity, this extremely high inline specificity, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is that your specificity graph is pretty flat. Whether that flat line is at the bottom or the top of the scale doesn't matter much. Source order is less of a problem, too, because you don't have styles living in this external global style sheet anymore. You have extremely fine-grained control of how they're applied to your different elements. You can you know, define the order of styles right in your component. You can merge things together in a tightly controlled order. You don't have to worry about any weird collisions cropping up over time. Naming is not a problem anymore, either, because you get access to real scope through JavaScript. So there are no more global variables leaking around. You don't have to come up with a unique name for this weird call to action button thing. You don't have to use structured class names like you would in BEM to keep things consistent and orderly. If your sidebar has a title, you can call that style object title, and you're done. It makes dead code elimination a lot easier, too. You can be sure that your styles are only applied to the component that you're pulling them into. So when that component's gone, 
the styles are too. And typically your build system can just remove this entirely for you. You don't have to use some system like UnCSS that's gonna you know, look through your application running in a browser and find the unused styles, which is a pretty good solution. But depending on the size and complexity of your app, it may or may not be for you. With inline styles, you get it for free, which is cool. So together, all of these things mean that inline styles are really easy to modify and maintain over time in a way that CSS often isn't. This means that it's a really nice way to write styles with a large team. So we discussed these five things before, and they're all dealt with. I guess Christopher should always on to something. No more CSS. OK, so if that's what React gives us, what does Radium do? So as I mentioned before, inline styles a lot of features missing that you kind of need for a real application. Radium aims to fill in those gaps and make it accessible and easy for everyone to use by writing a lot of boilerplate code. One of the first things we dealt with was browser states, pseudo selectors, things like hover, focus, and active. You, uh, you almost can't write an application without these, well, not usually. And with inline styles, you can't do them. There's no concept of a selector, so there's no concept of a pseudo selector. The way we deal with this in Radium is that we allow you to pass in nested objects in your style objects that include names like hover, focus, and active. Under the hood, Radium checks if these states are currently active on a component and merges those styles into the base object and then applies them. So again, the authoring experience is not that different from writing CSS, especially if you're using SAS and a nested syntax. This might look kind of familiar. Under the hood, we do this with React event listeners. All event listeners in React are delegated, meaning there's only one mouse enter listener in your entire app. So it's pretty performant, but it's still tedious boilerplate code. And it would be error prone if you're writing this everywhere you wanted the hover state. So it was a thing that was an easy decision to abstract pretty early on. We dealt with media queries in pretty much the same way. We allow you to pass in nested media query objects, as many as you want. And if that media query is active, they'll be merged back into the base styles. Under the hood, we do this with the Match Media API, which again is a pretty performant, nice way of dealing with it, but not something you want to be writing yourself every time. It's kind of a pain. The last major feature of Radium is style arrays. So React components take style objects by default. These are a single level deep with some CSS styles. Style arrays allow you to pass in multiple objects, and then Radium will merge them together at the end when it's time to render your component. This is a good way of allowing you to pass in modifiers and different states so you have more control over components because you almost always have different states and different ways of styling the same component. So conceptually, this is pretty similar to writing, say, a bunch of modifier classes with HTML and CSS, except that they're different style objects instead. So to kind of grasp how this works, let's make an example. Let's do a little button. So again, we can start off with a basic style object apply some base styles. And this button will be mobile first. So on narrow screens, it'll take up the full width of the screen. Use this display block declaration. You'd actually need width 100% too, so don't eviscerate me for that. So we'll say that your button should have some, some states, right? A button you can't interact with. It's not clickable. It's not very fun. Nobody likes that. So we added a nested hover object. We changed the background color. Easy enough. Later on, we want the button to take up its natural space on wider screens. On a phone, it makes sense to take up the full screen, but on a larger screen, not so much. So if our screen is wider than 400 pixels, we reset the display property. Then finally, we add in this style array so you can pass in modifiers. Buttons are something that tend to have a lot of different modifiers. There are a lot of use cases you're going to be applying them in. So in this case, we have this styles base object we're applying all the time. We conditionally add a styles this props kind object. Kind is a property we pass into the component as an option, so we can determine different, it's essentially different modifiers. And then if the component has a block property, we can apply the styles block object as well. So with this kind of setup, we can do things like pass in a kind inverse attribute to get a different color scheme. We can add a block property, so we can get that nice block styling. Or we can do both at once. What's really nice here is that you get excellent control over which modifiers are applied together 
So, so you have cases where you have a button primary and a button inverse class, and someone accidentally uses them both at once, and then your styles blow up. That's not an option anymore, because you can say that your kind can either be primary or inverse. You can control that really well. So what's the problem? I'm happy to report there isn't any. Inline styles are great and perfect, and everything is solved. Just kidding, not so much. They're pretty good, but there are some issues. The biggest thing, probably, in my opinion, is that Radium especially, everything Radium does, well, almost everything, is dedicated to faking things that CSS already does pretty well. Hover selectors, media queries, there's no benefit to rewriting this functionality and making this work in JavaScript, except that we can do it and it makes inline styling possible. It's not a win over CSS by any means. If I could use the native ones, I would. I'm also sad to report that our progressive enhancement story isn't quite where I'd like it to be. For the most part, progressive enhancement with React apps and inline styling is pretty good. All of your applications can be rendered on the server side. There's no JavaScript dependency. The one issue there is that if you're using, say, media queries and hover states with Radium, that behavior depends on having JavaScript enabled. We have some workarounds there, so you can pass in like your screen size on the server to render at a given size. Um, and we're working on different ways of dealing with that. We're not quite there yet. A funny thing about our solution for that is it'll almost certainly involve generating CSS based on our inline styles, which is kind of goofy. The biggest issue is probably that inline styles are a React-only game at this point. The main reasons for that are React's use of the virtual DOM and diffing. So the virtual DOM isn't as mysterious as it sounds. At least when I first heard about it, I had no idea what people were talking about. But all it really is is that when React renders your application, it renders out an object that includes the serialized state of your application at that moment, all the elements you currently have on the page. Then when you re-render your app, because you've gotten new data, you're changing a class name or a style, it'll make a new version of that virtual DOM and then compare the two. React will find the differences between the two and only make those changes to the actual page. This is a big part of why it's fairly performant to write React applications. This is what's known as diffing. So what this is is that React is going to make the smallest possible change to a page that it possibly can. That's a big part of why inline styles are performant and usable this way. So as an example, you can imagine that we have an unordered list, a couple of list items, and we want to add a third. If you're writing, say, a backbone application, you would most likely empty out that entire UL and then add in all three list items at once when you wanted to add the new one. React won't touch the first two. It'll leave them in place and just apply a new one to the page. This gets more fine-grained as well. If you have an individual class name you're toggling on and off, just that class name will be changed. Or even a single inline style. So for to change one color rule in one of our style objects, only that will be re-rendered, which is pretty nice. And aside from being more performant than having huge layout thrashing because you're re-rendering the entire DOM all the time, it just makes sense conceptually. It's, if you're doing this procedurally, somehow you're you know, telling it set color to white, it just wouldn't be, it wouldn't make any sense. It'd be hard to work with. Still, as much as I love inline styles in React, as much as I wish I could write every application this way, I think about my users without JavaScript. I think about my friends using things other than React. And I wonder if there's any way for them to get the same benefits. I wonder if somehow CSS can learn from inline styles and get more scalable, easier to write in the future. So there have been some reports that inline styles are going to kill CSS. And I think those reports have been a little bit exaggerated. I think, if anything, CSS is going to learn from inline styles. And there's a lot of great movement right now in the CSS landscape towards more maintainable, scalable styles. A lot of that's coming from user land tooling, from developers working in the space between CSS, React, and inline styles, trying to find ways of bringing these benefits to the language without abandoning it wholesale. One of the things I'm most excited about right now is CSS modules. This is a specification and set of tooling for bringing a JavaScript-like module system to CSS, giving you scoping, namespacing, everything that you would really want. It's not a coincidence that a lot of the benefits of using inline styles with something like React are that you 
they're, they're, your styles live in a JavaScript module system, so you don't have to deal with scope anymore. So bringing that power to CSS makes a lot of sense. This is an example of what CSS modules look like. So you can imagine that we have a blog post.css file, and inside of it we have a title class, some styles applied. You'll note that title is a pretty generic class name, and that's probably going to collide with something pretty quickly. Somewhere else in our application, say a blog post.js view file, we can import this style sheet into our JavaScript using CSS modules and cache it onto a styles object. Then, in this case, I'm going to write it sort of pseudo React y, but you could use it with handlebars or something else. We can make that styles object available as a variable and refer to it when we're setting class names on components. So we have an h2 element, and we say that the class is styles.title. Title is taken from the class name in the blog post.css file automatically. When we look at our rendered HTML, we see that we don't get that generic title class, but a uniquely generated class name based on those styles. So that class name will only appear in places where we're using this particular title class from blog post.css. Any other title classes are independent and they don't affect each other. Turns out with that one simple trick, you deal with a lot of issues. Naming collisions, no longer a problem. Dead code modification becomes easier because you have more control of where styles are being applied. You can remove them more easily. And modifying styles for the same reason. Specificity and source order are still kind of problematic, which is unfortunate because they're a couple of the biggest problems in my, uh, in my experience. So there's another feature of CSS modules that might help with this called composition, which I'm also very excited about. So this is an example of how composition works. Imagine we have a blog post.css file again. It has two class names this time. Normal sets a font size. And highlight sets a color. It also includes this weird components or composes normal declaration. This is not valid CSS, obviously. So the way this works is it's a way of specifying a dependency between highlight and normal through CSS modules. This highlight class can't be used without the normal class coming along with it. Again, in our blog post.js file, we can import that style sheet and set the class on the h2 element to styles.highlight. In our rendered HTML, you can see that both of those dependent classes are applied, although we just set styles highlight in our template. So this is extremely powerful, actually, and it's kind of similar conceptually to any other module system. Classes can have dependencies and can bring those along with them without you having to think about it or worry about it. In some ways, this is similar to extend using a preprocessor like SAS. A lot of developers, myself included, aren't huge fans of extend. You can generate a lot of really gnarly selectors. They bloat your style sheets. They're hard to debug. Things like this, where we had a button element, or a button class, rather, and we extended it into a bunch of different modifiers. So we end up with this massive selector with very few styles in between. With CSS modules, our style sheet doesn't get any bloat. We can have our button selector, any other modifiers, and they're tied together through the module system, but they get appended in our templates rather than in our CSS. If you've ever experimented with a single responsibility CSS system like base CSS or tachyons, you might have some ideas right now about how you can apply this. So the way something like base CSS works is it's a CSS framework with a ton of different extremely small classes. They all do like one or two things. You might have one class name for setting color, one for setting border, one for setting padding. Together, those can make a button. With CSS modules, rather than having that complexity in your templates and having to think about it that way, you could, um, you could compose all these different single responsibility classes together in your style sheets into these sort of amalgamous selectors. I don't know what they'd be called and apply those in your templates instead, which is a little bit cleaner way of dealing with that kind of dependency. The thing I really like about this is that it, it solves the same problems as inline styling and radium, but it doesn't abandon CSS. Instead, it turns to user land tooling, trying to find new ways to push the language forward without waiting for a specification. And I think this is great progress. I often hear about tooling fatigue, and I feel it myself too. You know, there's 
a new framework, a new build tool every week or two. And it's hard to know what's worth looking into, what's worth working with. It can get exhausting. I think that's fair. But we should always encourage experimentation in this way. Because through finding new ways of authoring like this, we can push our authoring experiences forward. We can solve common problems. Every project I've ever worked on, and I'm sure everyone here has ever worked on, is constrained by some things. We have limited budgets. We have limited timelines. We have to make the best decisions that we can to serve our users within those constraints. By embracing tooling, we can find ways to get rid of repetitive problems that shouldn't really be problems. You know, pick the low-hanging fruit so that our jobs can be a little bit easier. By improving the developer experience this way, we can improve our user experiences, which is really the thing that matters most. Alternately, there's been a lot of movement in the specification lately as well, which will, I think, help with scalable CSS in a lot of ways. The first, first thing I need to talk about just a little bit is web components and styling with the Shadow DOM. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but web components are in some ways similar to React components. They're an encapsulated modular way to define different pieces of your application. And they come with some really nice styling benefits. So we can imagine here that in our application, we have buttons. They have a blue background, a nice font. And we use a global selector there, which is probably a bad idea. Choose a class name or something. Later on in our application, we'll say we want to add a web component with a new, even cooler button. Within our web component, we can define styles that will only apply to that component, a different background color, different font family. And those styles are only going to apply within instances of that component. They don't leak out into the rest of our styles. And our global styles don't leak into the web component unless we specifically want them to. This is really powerful and cool. The only downside is you need to be using web components for it. You can try it right now with a polyfill like Polymer, and you can do some really cool things. I encourage you to check it out. If you're interested in that, I highly recommend you check out Phil Walton's talk, which I think is immediately after this one. I think it's called Web Components and the Future of Modular CSS. I'll be there. I'm super excited about it. Outside of web components, there are a lot of features coming to CSS that give us a little bit of computation, not to the same degree that you would get using JavaScript and inline styles, but a little bit closer. So these, most of these are encapsulated as runtime variables, things like custom properties. These are pretty similar to a variable you would write in a preprocessor, with the difference that there is no processing required. This is native to CSS as a language evaluated at runtime and can be changed at runtime. This example, we have a background color set to green. And if we wanted to, we could add a new rule saying the background color is blue with JavaScript and change those styles at runtime. This applies outside of individual properties as well. We have custom media coming soon. We're able to name media queries and use them throughout an application. Only need to define what a media query is in one place. And even selectors. We can make groups of selectors using the custom selector specification and then apply styles to those over time. One of the really cool things here is that you can do things like apply pseudo selectors to your custom selectors. So in this example, we have button hover background color. This is equivalent to writing button the HTML tag name colon hover and dot btn colon hover. This is probably something you want to use sparingly, but I think there are some really cool possibilities. Another specification I want to draw attention to is a proposal by Tab Atkins for native CSS extend. You'll recall I badmouthed extend a little bit earlier, but I'm really excited about this one. So native extend, if it makes it into the spec, would be essentially the same as something like extend in SAS, except that, again, there's no compilation involved. It exists at runtime. So you don't get these bloated selectors being generated. And debugging should be a little bit easier. The thing I'm most excited about here is that native extend would allow extending into media queries, which is something that preprocessors can't do. So you can imagine that we have styles for two different components defined. We have modals and panels. We have a widget on our page that on a narrow screen should be a panel, and on a large screen should be a modal. Right now, we would need to probably duplicate those styles using a mix-in and a media query in both places, 
Or maybe we could render two versions of the component, one with modal and one with panel, then hide them based on screen size. With native extend, we could extend our options component using either of those other components based on the screen size and get extremely powerful, expressive control over components that fits really well with modular design systems and pattern libraries responsibly. Something I've wanted for a long time. It'd be awesome. So sometimes when I talk about inline styles and CSS modules, I hear people say that CSS is fine. People are solving problems that don't exist. I respectfully disagree with that. The main reason I disagree is that when people say CSS is fine, they, always, they almost always they had a condition. They say, CSS is fine. You just have to do this. It's fine as long as you do these things. As long as you only style with class names, so your specificity is manageable, you'll be OK. As long as you use a structured naming convention, you'll be able to make things work. And it's true that if you do everything right, everything perfectly, your project can probably get by pretty well. The people who are really familiar with CSS best practices on your team, they can help everyone out and keep things moving pretty well. I think that the fact that we have to do things perfectly is emblematic of a problem, something we should try to solve. I think if our projects have one or two CSS gurus that people are coming to, when they have a specificity conflict on top of a naming collision, on top of a z-index stacking war, don't get me started on z-index, that's a problem. Things are harder than they need to be, and it's hurting our user experiences. It's making our jobs less fun. I think that by embracing tooling, by embracing new developments in the language, we can find ways to fix these common, easy problems. Because really, the things I talked about today, specificity, naming collisions, source order, they shouldn't be hard problems to solve. And I think they are solvable. So we should deal with them and get on with our lives. We should make CSS easy and fun so that we can build better applications and do better work. Thanks. And again, if you're removed, please vote. Yeah, absolutely. Any questions, please? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good question. Okay. Yeah, so the question was, if you're using something like inline styles in Radium, is it more or less performant than using CSS, effectively? If you're having bloated selectors, are you going to have performance issues? I can only answer this anecdotally. There hasn't been a ton of research on the subject yet. A big part of it is that there are some performance wins you get for free. If you're using inline styles, I highly encourage you to render them on the server. A nice benefit of this is you get something like critical CSS loading for free. Your initial server render is going to get the styles for the current page immediately without being blocked by loading an external style sheet. Then you can load the JavaScript for your app at the bottom of the page asynchronously, which means that the initial load is a little bit faster. And then the rest of your styles are in the JavaScript, and there's no particular bloat there. They're cached just like your style sheets would be. As far as runtime performance, anecdotally, again, no one I have talked to has seen any serious issues with inline styling. There have been some discussions about it. Some of the people on the Chrome team have chimed in and suggested it should be OK. But without more research into it, I couldn't say for sure. I can say that I haven't seen anything personally, uh, runtime-wise. Seems to work OK. Sure. Sure. So is there room for regular CSS along with inline styles? Where do you find the division there? I think definitely there are a lot of use cases for regular CSS. You can also write applications with no CSS at all if you wanted to. 
Um, a really common use case is going to be something like including a reset or normalized CSS. That makes a lot of sense to just include as a style sheet. You can also use inline styles really well with something like an existing CSS framework. For our purposes today, let's talk about Bootstrap, right? You can imagine you pull Bootstrap into a project and use all of that CSS, all those classes. Then you can use inline styles to write your application-specific styles. It can be the glue tying your Bootstrap app together. And that way, you have no collisions with Bootstrap styles. You don't have to worry about specificity. So it's actually a really nice interface and way of dealing with existing frameworks. You can tie your things together using inline styles for one-offs and different things like that. So short version of the answer is, yeah, you can use a lot of CSS or a little or none. It totally depends on what you want to do. I think there's valid use cases.